This is Take Flights with Mark Whittle. Matthew, at long last, welcome to the Take Flight podcast. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honoured. Honestly, I'm honoured and have been looking forward to this for such a long time. Um, I'm assuming you're a morning person because you're in San Francisco and it's 7 a.m. and you've, you said you've done an hour call already. Yes. So um, I'm directing a short film that's being made in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And so for the last 15 months, my mornings have started pretty early, usually around 3 p.m. their time, which is, you know, I don't even know anymore. Is that 6 a.m., 5 a.m., somewhere around there. But yeah, so I've been a morning person. Yeah, you've been forced to be a morning person. Yes. <laughs> so I just want to reflect some things back to you that you were the youngest Simpsons writer ever at 19 years old leaving uh, yeah I was the I was the I was 19 years old and I was the youngest Simpson animator uh hired on the third season of mm. the Simpsons which was mm. that was my foot in the door yeah amazing and then moved to Pixar and worked on some of my favorite animations ever and I've written some down here Toy Story Toy Story 2 Monsters Inc Finding Nemo Cars Ratatouille uh, up mm. and Toy Story 3 and the list goes on how does that feel to have those films next to your name you know in the in the very beginning working on Toy Story most people thought that film was going to be a complete utter disaster um, most people in the animation industry um, felt that nobody's going to want to go watch a movie that doesn't have a prince or princess with a fairy tale village and the musical numbers of the I want songs like I want to be a part of your world or, um, mm. you know, have legs and not fins. So uh, <laughs> also people were really doubted that an audience could be entertained for 90 minutes watching something that was animated on a computer. So when I was working on Toy Story, while I was having fun and I thought it was a great story, um, it most people thought it was going to fail. But then after that film came out, um, Pixar really became a household name and Toy Story. And after that, I think that's when it started to progressively get surreal of of how how much of a positive effect um, the films I w we were working on had on the world, which was crazy. I know it sounds so naive, but you know, after working on Monsters Inc. and Nemo, and then doing some traveling, visiting my family in Europe, and and going into you know uh, a, a a Dutch or German. Uh, store and seeing Pixar toys in there going what they they like these movies too like it was it was so naive thinking it was only in the states that people were enjoying these movies but yeah it was it was crazy um I, I, revolutionized film forever and uh, it, yeah. that's the, there's a beauty behind what you're saying there though because sometimes we do follow whether we call it our passion or whatever that thing is or just something that we love doing and you don't always have to have this massive big goal for the outcome but then yeah. yours has happens like that what, what were the conversations like in the room when you were creating Toy Story well you know the the interesting thing is that most of us that worked on Toy Story in the animation department and in the story department and the directors we all came from the same school we all mm. came from the same university called Cal Arts, the California Institute of the Arts. And this was at the time in the 70s and into the 80s. This was really the only animation school you could go to in the United States. And it was created by Walt Disney before he passed away. And it was really the place where all of these weirdos went <laughs> that were adults that liked cartoons and liked films. And we all just were there because this was our, our bliss, our passion. We had no idea that we would ever make money at this or that animation would become cool again. But this is where we all went. And we always felt that 
animate the best animated films were the ones that were written like a movie, hmm. just like Chinatown or or Close Encounters of the Third Kind or Star Wars. I mean, this is we were there to make films, but we also loved cartoons. And so when we were working on Toy Story, um, we were doing what we loved. And we were trying to make an animated film that was going to end up reaching all ages, all cultures, but still be a cartoon. And at the time, people still thought cartoons are just for kids. So that's what we really wanted to change. Hmm. Do you think that because you didn't have these massive expectations of it, that that had a, a part to play in why it was so successful? You know, uh, during that time of Toy Story uh, being released in 1995, there were some other, you know, great films that were getting released around that period of time too, like Nightmare Before Christmas mm -hmm. came out uh, maybe the year before Toy Story. And there was a, a great, you know, other mo animated films getting released. But we, uh, I don't think we had any idea of the impact Toy Story was gonna make. Um, Cause it was really like this blend between technology, art and and design. And so, well, I guess I would say, I guess if I really would say it would be like technology, art and story. That was really like the, the, the secret pieces to making that great. And um, yeah, we had no idea it was going to have such a big impact, but we were certainly having fun when we were making it. And yes, we didn't have to think to ourselves, you know, we hope people see our computer animated film other th than the others, because there was no others yet. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and, and that's one of those things about, you know, a startup company in the very beginning, when you have a small team, you you feel like you don't have as much to lose, you hmm. know, because you don't have anything yet. We were all like in our twenties. We most of us were sleeping at work uh, afterwards because we were so exhausted. We we didn't have a lot to lose, so so we took big chances. Hmm. That almost that naivety, isn't it? Yeah, that's that thing about hmm. when you have a startup, you have nothing to lose, and you take big chances. You go hmm. all in. It's funny hearing about Pixar as a startup now. <laughs> yeah, just, but when I started working there, there was only 80 people. Hmm. So was there, I'm not too familiar with the history. Was this the, the stage where Steve Jobs had invested or was that further down the line? No, you know, the, it, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, and I don't even know if this is in a, a book yet, but the origins of the Pixar story was that um, Pixar was owned by George Lucas, the guy who made mm. Star Wars, right? And George Lucas had so much money at his, you know, all of his different facets of his company. And one of them was that he was experimenting with computer animation. And the very first time he used some computer animation in one of his films that he did the special effects for it was Young Sherlock Holmes. And there was a stained glass window in a church that kind of came to life and the stained glass figure was a knight and and uh, it, it came to life. And it was the animation was done by that small Pixar team of like three people at George Lucas's studio. And then when Steve got fired from Apple um, and he had a lot of money, he wanted to invest in the next thing he felt was going to to change the world and he wanted to buy that division of pixar from george lucas but george lucas didn't want to sell it hmm. but then later on when george lucas was going through a divorce and he needed money he <laughs> did end up selling it to steve and so steve owned this this the the kind of software and these three people who worked in the pixar division and one of those people was going to be the director of Toy Story later on. And that's where it all began, was really wow. with Steve believing that this could be something more than just being used for special effects. 
Mm. So you, so, so I imagine there was some pressure even at that startup position of Steve being there and the money that was invested and yeah. And you know, I think Steve, after he left Apple, he went through, <clears throat> he went through a, a change himself. Uh, his um, method of doing business in the early days of Apple uh, definitely changed when he got let go. And mm -hmm. he always saw Pixar as his place to play. He always called it his sandbox where he could be doing his work everywhere else, but he could always go back to the sandbox where everyone was having fun, dreaming up ideas. Mm -hmm. And he gave us so much creative freedom. He did let us know though, that we were, we are always one bad film away from going bankrupt. So mm -hmm. Don't let that stress you out, but we do <laughs> need to still pay the bills. So let's make sure we make something that's going to, be relatable and universal to people um, when you're thinking up of the story. <laughs> so, mm. what well, what a great message as well to have the idea of a sandbox. I love that. We should all have yeah. a sandbox. Yeah, we should. You know, have mm. I? I know. I I I still have that even with the different projects I'm working on. I have a uh, those group of people in my life that I know I can jump in at any time, and we can brainstorm up new ideas and and that's my play time hmm. Hmm. yeah amazing amazing so matthew you're an expert storyteller one well, of the best in the of, world well okay well you you that's great keep saying that that's great i will you don't have to you don't have to accept this <laughs> <Okay>. this is <laughs> this is what All so right. what one of the best in the world 20 years at pixar you know you deliver fantastic talks you work with businesses to help them better understand their own stories and i'm going to do something that maybe is a bad idea but i'm going to attempt to tell a story okay. to an expert right. storyteller and then you okay. can you can pick that apart for me All right. and, and the story is how this came about how this conversation that we're having right now came about so if you imagine there's me who is working in a company that i don't really like and i've been in this position in different companies for quite some time and I'm sat in a huge auditorium. There's probably five, four or 5,000 people in there. And I might be exaggerating, but for the sake of the story, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's thousands. Um, and to say that I don't really want to be there is an understatement. I've just got back from holiday. I've spent a lovely time abroad. You don't remember holidays anymore. Mm. But I just got back from holiday, had a bit of sun, some rest. So I was a bit jet lagged because I was fortunate enough to go to America and I'm sitting here not really enjoying it thinking oh how long till this finishes until someone stands on the stage and delivers a talk which I am blown away by so I'm so enamored by this talk I'm sat there thinking at the end I have to speak to this person I have to somehow speak to this person so as the talk is drawing to an end I can feel it's coming to an end I'm thinking shit am I going to have the balls to stand up in front of all these people walk down the aisle everyone see me stand on stage and follow him off the stage so I work up the courage and I think fuck it I'm just going to do it so I stand up walk down follow off the stage and there's like these stairs behind the door and the guy lets me go through because I guess he just assumes I'm with the speaker and I run up the stairs I can't see where he's gone I run up the stairs and I'm like where's the speaker gone and uh, and someone just says to me oh he's he's just gone to get a drink he'll be back in a second and as he says that you walk past and I say, Matthew, probably a little bit louder than I should have done. <laughs> and you turn around and I shake your hand and tell you how impactful the talk was. And we've been in communication on email for two and a half years since mm. then. And today we're speaking, which is why I'm, I'm so excited. Oh. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking specifically about storytelling oh, that's, that's um, and everything you spoke about. So. Well, I didn't, I didn't see that coming, but that is awesome. Do you where, remember where, what, if, what, just out of curiosity, was mm. it, it, I mean, it must've been in London. It was. Okay. It was in London. Um, and it was for Salesforce. Oh, okay. And it was our, it was our, our like annual kickoff, which is why there were so many people there. Cause we bring the whole okay. of the UK 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> and in fairness, although I didn't like the company, they do do those things really, really well. So yeah, yes. you delivered a talk and I'm a huge Disney, huge Pixar fan. Uh, so um, I was brought in immediately. And, and the things that you spoke about, like how to tell a story, story arcs, mm-hmm. the heroes, the emotions and chemicals even that are yeah. released during a story. And, and I was just so hooked. And um, so yeah, I, I have actually left that company now. I'm full time with Take Flight now. So lots changed very, very since cool. then. But, yeah. That's that is awesome to hear. <laughs> um, so I'll start with a real open one. But what does what is story, and what does it mean to you? You know, um, there's there's a combination. You can get into the very like deep meaning, which. You know, I, I think about one of my heroes in storytelling is Joseph Campbell. He's hmm. he, he wrote a great book that was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces and another book called The Power of Myth. And his description of why we tell stories and what are the significance of stories is, is you know, I'm going to quote this wrong, but basically he said that, you know, we tell stories um, to find significance for ourselves in life why 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 we're born why we die why we fall in love why we fall out of love all of these things are confusing and don't always make sense in our lives but we end up having a a little bit of a better grasp of the answer of these big meanings of life when they're told with a story and the other easier way of saying this is simply also that story is entertainment, mm-hmm. right? Story ends up taking us out of our lives, out of our heads, and helps make sense of the world around us. And so, yes, when I'm creating a story, I want to make sure I'm entertaining people, but I also know that there is a deeper purpose of of that project I'm I'm working on that it mm. serves a, a a a deeper purpose that is going to help people find significance with their lives. Mm. Could you explain a little bit more about the hero's journey? Because it's so sure. funny you say that. I, I picked the book up; it's on the floor just there, Joseph Campbell, yeah. uh, last week. So, so, you know, uh, I could talk about this kind of stuff forever, but let me, I'll try to, I'll try to simplify it for the audience. Um, so believe it or not, if you look at the oldest stories ever told, like of Gilgamesh or the stories that the Egyptians or Canaanites told the oldest stories told around the world. And if you looked at these, you would see that there's two two things that that run through all of these stories these stories that were written or told by cultures around the world that had never met each other they never shared with each other <clears throat> each other's stories like we can easily do now but the amazing thing is they always had two things in common there was always a main character in a story that went through a journey and the journey had a beginning a middle and an end now isn't this really strange that before before people had a, a telephone, the internet, a boat to simply get in, to be able to sail somewhere, to say, hey, look at this, this book we have written. When we've collected all these stories, they've always had a hero on a journey. Now, there's really two reasons why this is happening. One is because all of us see ourselves as the main character of our own story. We see ourselves as the hero of our story. It's like the Truman movie with Jim Carrey. Remember that one where he's the main Hmm. character of a TV show? We all see ourselves as the main character of our story. It's really our, it's our human psyche, right? And because we have, there's been this beginning, middle, and an end in stories is because every day people witness a beginning, a middle, and an end. So all those different cultures that wrote those stories thousands of years ago, they all woke up every morning with the sun coming up like we do, and the sun being in the sky, the middle of the day, and then the end of the day with the sun going down. There's been a beginning, a middle, and an end. Hmm. There's also been, been a beginning, middle, and an end with, with the cycle of our lives, 
people have witnessed birth, life, death. So that is why these stories have always had a hero on a journey. Now, when Joseph Campbell wrote that book, he basically was one of the first guys to, to say, look at all the similarities of these stories people have told in different cultures. And then look at the stories we're still telling today. It's still a hero on a journey. Now, sometimes that hero can be one person or it can be a group of characters, a multi-cast uh, uh, um, that is a whole group of characters on a journey. But it's really amazing to see that this, this type of storytelling has been going on ever since we were able to sit around a fire in a tribe and, and weave a story. Hmm. It's, it's the hero on a journey. Mm. it's so good it's, it's funny and when when joseph campbell talks about those steps in the hero's journey when you're called to adventure mm -hmm. you you take that step you find your mentor you you face trials and tribulations go into the cave the deep dark cave yeah. and you emerge you resist returning and then you finally do take that step to return and you share your your lessons from that journey Ab absolutely you know and i feel like <clears throat> every once in a while i'm watching a movie and I go, wow, they totally nailed it. All of, all of those things that Joseph Campbell has talked about was weaved into that story. And I know that's one of the, the key things I'm always thinking about when I'm animating, I'm storyboarding, I'm writing or I'm directing is how to be able to weave that hero's journey into the project I'm working on. Hmm. Can you see how that's playing out in your own life? Like how you listen and hear that call and... Yep. You know, I I really do believe that this is something that happens every day and, um, and over the course of our entire life. You know, every day is, is there's a, a story going on. And, you know, some of the key points in making a story is, you know, like I mentioned, you need a hero. The hero needs a goal, something they want, but there's a set of obstacles. They're making it hard for them to reach their goal. And then at the end, they reach their goal. And maybe that journey changed them. And it may it enlightened them, maybe it made them more brave or more caring. So it can be anything from, I got to go to the dentist today, right? That right there is a story that's going to happen for the day. There's a goal, set of obstacles, a change. But then we have these many stories that happen throughout our life. You know, finding love, falling out of love, having a kid for the first time, being a parent, being a, being the kid, um, embarking off to going to college or getting that first job. There is all of these many stories going on in our lives. And the awesome thing is, for the most part, you are the director of those stories. So you get to, you know, try as hard as you can, but to write how do you want the ending of those stories to be? Now, we know that there's a lot of outside forces that sometimes make it more difficult for us to reach that outcome we want to get to in, in those stories. But we do have the ability to write our story, you know, and of, of how, we, how, we, how we want our lives to, to uh, unravel, uh, not unravel, but, but to... to uh, come to be we have those mm. choices yeah that's it's really liberating to think like that as well isn't it yeah yeah you know we can prove i don't want to get into this too much but you know when we were kids the people that wrote our story were uh you know our parents our family the teachers and our friends if somebody said you were smart you believed you were smart if someone said you were athletic you were athletic if you were funny, you were funny. But there comes a point in our lives where we have to be the ones that say, 
what, who do we want to be? What is our story going to be? And you can't have someone else write that story for you. And I think a lot of us get stuck in life because somebody has written a story for us and we think that that's who we are. And sometimes you have to rewrite your story and make your decision of how, what outcome you want your life to be. So. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Matthew, honestly, like this is something that I'm really, really passionate about is I like the way you called it story, but I, you know, call it uh, conditioning or programming, which sounds a little bit too heavy, but story is, yeah. is much nicer. It's up. You're absolutely right. In your experience, how, how many people do you think decide to then write their own story or have that realization that they can do it? Yeah, I think I, I, um, I, I was very fortunate. Okay. So I grew up in a home where my dad who wanted to be a Disney animator, ever since he was a little kid, wasn't given the opportunity because of the period of time he lived in, the culture, and it was, no, you're taking over the family business. So all those 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 aspirations of being a Disney animator, it's not going to happen, okay? Now, my dad, in turn, when I was a kid and saw that I could draw, he was like, you are going to live my dream and your dream. You're going to pursue art. So I had somebody in my life that was very encouraging, you know, that was definitely. Um, um, and, but there was also a lot of pressure, too, because <laughs> I did like to draw and I did like to create. But there was a feeling of, oh, my gosh, I better not let my dad down mm -hmm. or all my friends who see me as, you know, when I was in elementary school and um, in high school in the United States, that this was my calling, right? But later on in my life, I remember I was with um, an event where this, the speaker said, everybody out there who loves their job, oh no, uh, yeah, everybody out there who loves their job right now, raise your hand. And I just immediately raised my hand because <laughs> I, I, I was like, you know, working. I don't know. I was probably working. I was still working. You know, I was working on a Pixar film, raised my hand and I was in the front row. And then I kind of looked around and nobody else was raising their hand. And the speaker was kind of looking at me as if almost to say, hey, you're like ruining my whole talk. I want nobody <laughs> to raise their hand. <laughs> but I realized that a lot of people, for whatever reason in life, are doing jobs or doing things in their life that they feel they've been forced to or that they had no choice. And I understand sometimes it works out that way. But, but the advice I've always given to people who are, you know, in college or you know, wanting, you know, that are, are young or wanting to pursue their dreams is I always say, try to follow your bliss. Try to think about the thing that's, that make you happy, that you enjoy. And even if you don't think those things will make money, um, or maybe your parents or won't be happy about, those are the things you should pursue. Um, Cause you don't want to spend your one life pursuing or doing something that doesn't make you happy you know you only get one shot at this so mm. so i i've i have found that follow your bliss i think one of the hardest things for people um is what is that what mm. is that bliss what is that you know is there some special calling like how come i'm not getting it and one of the things like i have a 21 year old now one of the things I I always would pass along to him is, well, just make a list of all the things you hate hmm. and just make sure you don't do one of those. And, and that'll help you get closer to the things you do like, you know, and it may not it may not just be one thing, um, but but really find the things that make you happy and pursue those things. Hmm. Yeah, such great advice. I have a, a thing I call following the breadcrumbs, which is you try as many things as you possibly can. Yeah. And if you enjoy that one or someone else enjoys it, or you get a feeling of that bliss that you talked about, then you follow the breadcrumb, you pick the next one up and you yeah. you might keep going and that leads you somewhere 
hopefully it gives you that feeling. That's good advice. You know, I know that a lot of people out there, younger people think to themselves, college is just, you know, it's a waste of time, a waste of money. It's a scam. Why can't I just be one of those, you know, I'll, I'll just come up with that startup when I'm in, you know, when I'm in my teen years. But the whole purpose, I think, a big purpose of college and university and all that is to try a little bit of everything and start eliminating all of those different subjects you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. That's that's a big part of, of why you go away to do college or university. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, not to bring it back to a Pixar film, but that's one of those things we were playing with with Monsters University is, you know, you, you set off to go to college thinking, this is what I want to do. Mike Wazowski, I want to be a scarer. And then realizing you have a different calling. And <clears throat> that's the time in your life to, to be exploring those, those what ifs, you know? Hmm. One of my favorite films, by the way. I actually prefer yeah. it to Monsters, Inc., I think. It is a great film. I've worked yeah. on that one, too. It is, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it's so good. Um, just quickly, because I was fascinated when you were talking about your childhood, and I want to learn a little bit more about your journey as well after sure. we talked a bit more about storytelling. But I heard Barack Obama say the other day, if you've lived, generally speaking, quite a balanced childhood, you're more likely to go into a conventional adulthood. Oh, well, yeah, I guess that's that could be true. Um, I, I definitely did not have a conventional childhood. Um, I think at moments I've thought to myself, I had the most irresponsible father in the world. <laughs> but then at the other part, I go, <clears throat> I probably had the most inspirational father in the world, you know? Um, you know, and I, you know, my, my family has owned toy stores for four generations in the United States. My great, let me think here. Yeah. My great grandparents started these toy stores and that's just, that's been, you know, this was a different period of time, but it was that thing where the next generation would take over the family business And that's what my grandparents had in store for my dad. But my dad was that guy who just uh, always loved to draw. He was that creative kid. And um, that was really his calling. And he loves toys. Who doesn't love toys? Mm. But he really felt that it was because of especially his dad that he didn't get to pursue his dream of being a Disney um, animator, being an artist. And so my dad, this hippie um, who got pushed into doing a kind of a a business type job, when I came along, the first the first kid, he ended up taking me to the movies and not just the cartoon movies, but all the movies that were not appropriate to take (laughs) a five year old to. He would take me to all of them and um, he would take me to animation festivals when it wasn't a popular thing to do. And I'd always be the only kid and he would take me around the world to, you know, when he would be hunting out rare toy collectibles. And I was just always his 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 movie uh, traveling buddy. And he would. uh remove me for school from school for months to say this is more educational for us to do what i'm thinking is fun so so a lot of people probably saw that he was not a great father but um that um that way of life that he always had of follow the fun it's just like i just kind of live by that and so I always, I guess I've always had in my mind, why can't I do that? If I want to make, uh, write a book or make a movie, why can't I do that? There's no, that's nothing really stopping me except for my own willpower. Hmm. So it's pretty nice to be um, raised with that kind of thinking definitely Mm. not conventional um growing up in a toy store 
with a dad who who just surrounded me with art all the time. Hmm. So explains explains a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so I awesome. got lucky. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds incredible. So to go back to these stories, then you know we we got slightly derailed there, but it was sure. amazing. <laughs> I wanted to, to talk about that. So we're talking about the hero's journey and and the the depth of a story. So I'm interested to know is is it important for a writer to operate so many layers deeper than the surface level entertainment? Yeah, you know, I think for a long time, people in animation and in live action, um, they really dumbed down the audience, especially in animation. They thought it's just for kids. It's just a a ninety minute commercial that's going to sell toys. That's all we're focused on. And so the thing is that a lot of times these stories just focused on an outer conflict, you know, defeat the monster, um, save the princess. It was just an outer conflict. Now, when you have a story that's just an outer conflict, it can get boring really quick. Hmm. An outer conflict um, is basically just a stack of plot points of I just need to conquer these things or overcome these obstacles to get to my final goal. Now, when I talked earlier, I said, you need a hero, you need a goal, you need a set of obstacles, but you also need a change. Now, the thing that ends up giving a story more depth is you need to add in an inner conflict. Now, this is one of those things that I, I, I found when I was working on all these films that this was really the magic part you could it's it's not that difficult to create a story with a outer conflict with something you know we need to find or conquer but the really the the magic part of a story is how does the character and characters change through the journey to find that thing or rescue that person that's the thing that that creates more depth in a story did the character learn to have more courage or did they learn to become more caring? And so we call that the character arc or the inner conflict. So Harry Potter, he goes from being timid to becoming brave. Lightning McQueen goes from being arrogant to becoming compassionate. So you need this inner conflict, but then there's a third layer now, this is the part where most storytellers go, I got an inner conflict, I got an outer conflict, I'm done. But then the last third one is, is really this kind of psychological conflict. Um, this is the one that kind of gives it that final layer. Whatever the world accepts as their reality in your story, the, what the main character learns and what they go through should affect the rest of the world in your story. So if toys in a room have always believed that our entire purpose in our life is to be there for your owner so you could be played with and make them happy, that is the belief of the world. But by the end of Toy Story 3, Woody, because of his change, realizes that being there for a kid doesn't mean you always have to be physically right there with them. They could go off to college. You could be put up in an attic. You could be 5,000 miles away, but you will always still be there for someone. Now, my son, who's 21, he left for college on Monday hmm. and he's going to be miles away, but I am still always going to be there for him as his father. Even though he's not in the house, I will always be there for him. So that is the third part of the story puzzle that most people bail out on at the end. But how does your main character change the way the other characters look at their world? That's the third piece. So if you really want to like... <clears throat> think about how to create more depth in your story. It goes beyond just the outer conflict and inner conflict, 
but it's also that psychological conflict. How does the rules of the world get changed because of the the journey the character went on? Hmm. Such an art. It, you really made it. It sounds simple, face value to yeah. write a story, but oh my God, that is uh, many, many layers to that. And when you even think about this, you know, I've I've always thought of story as not just pertaining for just entertainment. Story is what makes the best educators, right? The best teachers out there are the ones that use story. The best business leaders are the ones that use story, right? And even when you look at people's lives and you look at the accomplishments and the journey that people have gone through, and even when you look at someone like Steve Jobs, he had a goal which was kind of to put a dent in the universe, right? Now, first, he was adopted. So he didn't know who his birth parents were for a long time. And he always felt like, who were those people that would give away a kid? And I've got to prove to them that they made a mistake. That's why Steve set out on this journey for his entire life. His goal was I'm going to prove that my existence was not meaningless. Hmm. And that's why he set out to change the world. But through that, he went through a lot of character arcs. And I think in the end, the big thing that he learned was to become more caring and to be more hmm. compassionate. And then when you look at, you know, yes, he reached his outer conflict of creating a, you know, personal home computer and different ways of blending technology and art. But then the big picture of the psychological conflict is, I think, he really changed the world, you know, to be able to, uh, not to, to, to say the Apple thing, but to think different, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so <clears throat> even in our, our own lives, thinking about the outer, inner, and psychological conflict is a really, I think, a really great thing to be able to help you find purpose in your own life. Hmm. Did you spend much time with Steve Jobs? I did. You know, the interesting thing is that Steve and I both grew up in the Bay Area. Hmm. And so all of the people who came to the Bay Area to work, the San Francisco Bay Area, to work in the tech industry, they were people from all around the world. But there was just a few of us that grew up actually in the Bay Area and got lucky with a job that was there. <laughs> but so all of the conversations that Steve and I would have over lunch were about our kids, was about growing up in the Bay Area. Um, you know, a lot of the same places that we liked to go and visit. We usually never talked about tech stuff. He would, if he was working on a project, before it was released to the public, he would bring it in and show it. And I would be able to pull, you know, he would say, check this out. What do you think of this? And I would hmm. be like, this is awesome, you know, but, but most of the time it was just talking about our own, our personal lives. Hmm. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. So something I've been kind of amusing meditating on the last few weeks which is why it's so great we're speaking now is how our language only does so much yeah our words can only try to explain or describe how we feel as best as as the language allows which is why when you were speaking about what happens during a story i found it so fascinating you know the chemicals that are released what that does to us and and how it makes it so much more impactful yeah. so you, you just explained beautifully the you know the three layers to a story could you talk a little bit about what is happening to the audience as they're listening and sure. hearing and going along the story so first part i'm gonna i'm gonna mention because you, you hinted at this is that yeah there's many different ways to be able to share and take in stories we got our five senses and <clears throat> most of the time we think storytelling is just writing on a paper right screenplay but how many times have we heard a song that either has lyrics or doesn't that has just so emotionally moved us there's been a story told from something we've heard even when we talk 
you know, certain actors just make better um, people to do voices for film. The inflections in a person's voice can tell a story. And then you can tell a story through something you smell, something you taste, something you touch. But I think we'll probably all agree that visual storytelling, whether it's uh, an Instagram post or something you share on Twitter, an image, a video, even if it has no talking, can tell a story, you know? And what is happening when we are telling a story is we are releasing chemicals in the listener. When, when I went to that school of Cal Arts, the first thing they told me was whatever you do, whether you're going to be an artist, a musician, an animator, a filmmaker, make people feel something. You've got to make people feel something. And that is what's happening when you are telling a story using one of those five senses, you are releasing chemicals in people. It could be you're releasing dopamine or endorphins or oxytocin or cortisol. And those chemicals end up producing a feeling in people and evoking an emotion. So <clears throat> when you have a moment in a story that is happy and also has some anticipation in it, that will release dopamine. And in turn, dopamine makes us more focused. It makes us remember what is being shared better. Because when you're sharing anticipation of what's going to happen in a story, obviously people are sitting on the edge of their seats. So they're, they're wide-eyed, they're wide-eared, and they're listening. But when you share a moment in a story that's more a sad moment of somebody passing away or somebody's heart being broken or some injustice happening, that will end up releasing oxytocin and oxytocin will make us have empathy for that character on the screen or the person up on stage and when we have that oxytocin being released and we have empathy we feel more generous we feel more generous to give our time our money um and so all of these different story moments like in the opening of the movie Up, we're releasing dopamine and oxytocin. And we're also releasing endorphins to make people laugh. And you can release endorphins when you're running on a treadmill, when you're dancing, when you're laughing. And when endorphins are being released, it does end up making you feel more creative and more at ease. So when you think about it, you're going to be in your next, you know, business meeting. And let's say that you're the boss, you're, you're the department lead, the manager. Do you want people to feel more creative? Well, you better be releasing endorphins. But if you don't want people to feel creative, then you would want to release cortisol. And that is the fear chemical. That's mm -hmm. when you end up making everyone stressed and fearful and people don't want to be able to come up with great ideas because they're afraid they could get in trouble for it. So these chemicals that are getting released can end up um, making people feel a certain way and be more productive or less productive, uh, whether they're at a job or in their own lives. And mm -hmm. I know from firsthand experience that people who have watched Pixar films and the chemicals that get released, and all great stories, those have had a big impact on people and the decisions on people of, of what they want to do with their lives. Hmm. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's more than just entertainment. It's finding significance in life, you know? It can be so, so impactful. It's funny, you were just talking about the, the various different chemicals that are released there. I was just... I've been on quite a clean diet recently. I had a, mm. a, a piece of cake yesterday for <laughs> okay. the first time in a while. Um, but I could just feel oh. the dopamine flooding oh, my brain, yeah. you know. And I've, I heard someone talk about dopamine as the anticipatory chemical. Mm -hmm. So like, that's right. I'm eating, all I'm thinking about is the next bite. I'm not even thinking about the moment. I'm not present at all. I'm thinking about what's next, what's next. That's the kind of anticipation, which is yeah. 
as you say, perfectly builds excitement if that's what you want. Oh, yeah. It's that same rush you get when you fall in love for the first, you know, when you fall in mm. love uh, at that, uh, you know, what, I'm sure we'll all fall in love many times, but that initial falling in love chemical, or if you're, uh, you know, there's that thing you want to eat, that cake, right? It's that that dopamine rush. Yeah. Mm. So good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Matthew, I really wanted to talk to you about the, the the whole idea of this this podcast is that taking flight, the taking a leap of faith. And there's yeah. a couple of key moments, whether you'd agree there might be more from your perspective, that but a couple that really stood out to me, which was so you got this this place in the greatest animation college in the world that Walt Disney created himself, right? And then you got offered a job to write for The Simpsons mm -hmm. at the age of nineteen. You'd only done a year there, and you decided to take that leap of faith into the job. And then another one when you you left that to then go into Pixar. So yeah. could you just talk a little bit about those two instances and what made you do it? Yeah. You know, I really think that it, it's, I know we're talking flight. Now, I don't want to make a mistake. I don't want it to come off as being flighty where mm. you just are fickle. And every time <laughs> something else looks more desirable, you just leave where you are to go there. I want, I'm not suggesting that, but what I am saying is that when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror, and if you can honestly say that you enjoy what you do for a job, where you are in life, if you can do that, you're in a good place. But we all know we're going to have bad days at work. We're going to have bad days at life, being a parent, being in a relationship, where you live. Everybody has bad days, but I would say if you end up getting in the, in the up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you can't say that you enjoy your job or where you are in life for more than a couple of months, then I think you need to start reevaluating things. Now, when I was at The Simpsons, it was a great job. I'd worked that whole first year from 19 into 20 years old. I loved it. I was living in Hollywood. It was great. And then when that third season was over, and it was like, awesome, Matthew, we'll see you back for the fourth season. In Hollywood, the way it was when you work on a TV show is you don't work just 12 months around every mm -hmm. over and over. There is usually three months where you don't work. That's when they play reruns when they used to play reruns. <clears throat> and so I'm like, well, what do I do now? And they're like, well, in the animation business, you, you know, you kind of go and you do a freelance job or you go on a vacation um, and you kind of live like a gypsy for a little bit and you just kind of wander and do the, do something. And, and it happened to be that when I was in that period of time of the don't know what I'm going to do during this time, uh, Pixar had seen one of my short films and said, can we give you the pitch for a movie we want to make? And, and when I Toy went Story. in for that 10 minute pitch with Steve Jobs and the director of Toy Story and the head of animation, I was so moved by the story. I said, I've got to be a part of this. But that was kind of a scary thing. I was leaving a totally safe job at The Simpsons. This is when The Simpsons was so hot, so popular. Hmm. And I was going to work at a startup on something that most people thought was going to fail. But I was so moved by the potential of what this could be and the story that I took that leap of faith. I was like, I'm going to take it. And there was also a lot of things, too, that was going to be difficult. Like I was going to have to learn how to animate on a computer. Hmm. Now, I was. On, on The Simpsons, I was animating the same way they were animating on Snow White with paper and a pencil and a light box and flipping, flipping your animation. I was going to embark on something that was really scary. But I knew that if I passed up on that, I was going to regret it. And I didn't know how long this thing was going to pan out working at Pixar. But, but then even while I was working at Pixar... I reached a point where I was like, 
there's a, you know, this was after 20 years, there's a lot of sequels that were starting to get made. There was this time where there was like a Finding Nemo 2, Finding Dory, and there was Cars 3 and Incredibles 2. And I started to feel like I need to keep pushing myself as an artist. What is the next step? And that is when, like now, I'm directing this animated short um, and I'm, I'm, I'm working as a story consultant on Netflix films and all these different things. But that was my next leap of faith chapter of how can I keep pushing myself to what is the next challenge? And the next challenge for me was directing and, you know, working with these, you know, I mean, when you look at Netflix now, Netflix is a real competitor of making mm. great animated films. And it's just these next chapters that may seem scary in life. But if you look in the mirror and you say, I'm not being challenged anymore, or I, I want to keep pushing myself, you've got to think about taking a chance. Mm. So... It's, it seems like all the way through you've kind of, and this is going to paint a really unfair picture, I'm sure, but you've kind of hit home run after home run. What, what would you put it down to like that? If it was one thing, if you could, what was that? What would you put it down to? Whether that's one thing that's allowed you to do that yeah. successfully or step <clears throat> into that fear? Well, I would say really follow the things that make you happy. Follow your bliss. And you can write your own story of how you want things to turn out. If you really want to do something, you can do it. You've got to just keep pressing in on it. But I also want to mention that I haven't shared all of the other crappy films I've worked on in my career and things that fell apart and things I wanted to do. Um, you know, we always kind of go through our story and share the highlights. Hmm. But oh my gosh, I've worked on Fern Gully 2, um, I like the first Fern Gully, but the Fern Gully too, that was a rough one. For the longest <laughs> time, I was pitching a film that I was going to direct that I wrote, and it was for this uh, character Gumby that was this green, very um, known character in the United States as the first stop motion character. I was pitching that thing everywhere, and that didn't go anywhere. There's many other avenues that I've gone in pitching ideas that – didn't didn't come to life but when i reached a point where i felt like okay i either need to pause on that or i need to let that one go i did end up picking myself back up and going okay what's the next what's the next thing i'm going to do i never mm -hmm. said all right well that's it i'm done i i just continued i don't want to say fighting but trying and 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 so I know we've all heard that whole saying of that, how much that pers uh, um, pers perspiration, <laughs> right? Yeah. Is that what they say? How much that hard work part is important to making making something come to life. Hmm. It is it is a lot of hard work in picking yourself up and trying again, so. Hmm. Yeah, brilliant, Matthew, thank you. I have a... Um... A note to myself here that just says "keep swinging," and I've got a little, uh, nice. a little, uh, nice. a Babe Ruth. <laughs> there you go, good. <laughs> and, and obviously and, Jordan in the background. Yeah, well. and I, I love that. I love that painting. That says, that says it Thanks. all. And I think yeah. you've already probably have talked about it before, of how many times Jordan has missed a shot. Yeah. And when you add up how many times he's missed a shot and how many he's made, you'd go, "Oh my gosh, what a failure." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But no, we're all going to miss the shot every once in a while. But it's all about just keep on trying, keep swinging, keep swimming, whatever you, yeah. whatever one you nice. want to say, right? Nice. So. Um, thank you, Matthew. How are you for time? Do you have, do you have two more minutes? Uh, yeah, up? I got two more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So the, so the last, we do the same three questions at the end. They're quick fire. I had one more that I just wanted okay. to ask you before we dive into those, which is if you could summarize a lesson from your time with the Simpsons, because I know you were surrounded by sure. incredible people in that team, a lesson f- and a lesson from Pixar, whether that's from Steve or from yeah. Ed Catmull or any of those guys as well. Like what, what are the big, big takeaways there? All right. So the first one for the Simpsons is I was the youngest person at the company. And <clears throat> that meant for me, it's not for everybody but I was also probably the least experienced. And the lesson I would say from the Simpsons is I did find people at the Simpsons that were really good at their craft. And, and I made a point to try to be a sponge and soak as much information from them as possible. That can be demeaning sometimes because you're admitting, I don't know anything, Mm -hmm. but, but it's really smart, just like in any great story, to find mentors to be able to say, please, like, I want to learn from you. So that's the mm-hmm. thing I learned from The Simpsons. From Pixar, I would really say that what I learned the most at, at Pixar was the importance of a story. You can have the best animation, the best music, the best voice actors, but without a great story, it's all going to unravel. <clears throat> And once Toy Story came out, the first computer animated film, it made money. Obviously, there were so many film companies out there that jumped on that and said, we're doing the same thing. But the reason why we don't remember those stories, is be- those films, those animated films, is because they didn't have a great story. Hmm. So the thing I really took away from all these years <clears throat> at Pixar is you got to have a great story. That is what everything hinges upon. And what's your favorite story? Um, <clears throat> from Pixar? Anything. Oh, what's your favorite my. story? Well, <clears throat> I would say at Pixar, it's definitely Toy Story. That's the mm-hmm. one. And, <laughs> you know, it's really hard for me to pick a favorite story out there. <clears throat> that um sticks with me but i would say that probably the story that i've shared the most that is obviously been important to me because i've done this is really the 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 journey and the story of my dad um that has probably been the story that's that has inspired me the most um and that's 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 probably the reason why I share that one. And then in turn, as I'm saying this, it's making me realize this, is that that is probably why the films that I enjoy the most and books are the ones that have a father-son story. Hmm. And I, you know, it just happens to be that <clears throat> those type of movies are <clears throat> Back to the Future, Star Wars, Finding Nemo, right? These father-son stories. They've always really resonated with me. And um, the stories that I'm even developing as as feature-length stories are ones that have father-son relationships as well. Mm. Well, okay, I can't wait to see them. Have you seen Field of Dreams? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a great one Great, too. great father-son. Yeah. So. Um, Really nice to hear. Really nice to hear. I expected you to say a film or something. So that's that's amazing. <laughs> so these last three, quick fire. The first one is, is there anything specific you've either discovered or come across recently that you're really excited about? Um, you know, I think recently, because I've never done this before, is directing composers to do the musical score for the film I'm working on. Mm. I've never been in the the place where <clears throat> I've I've worked with a composer to do music, and it's really made me realize how I mean I always knew this, but how important music and a score and a melody is uh, when telling a story. Music totally tells a story, mm. and so that's been that's been a really fun new facet of storytelling that I've been able to to do that's been that's been exciting for me. Awesome. It's, it's so 
amazing the growth in your life when you do understand something like that on another level like like you said you yeah. I, I knew that but now i know that yeah <laughs> um matthew one habit you would recommend all listeners to incorporate into their day hmm. that is a that is a good one um i don't see myself as a workaholic um hmm. i think my wife sometimes says that you know, when was the last time you uh, didn't work? Um, <laughs> and I go, well, <laughs> I don't see it as work. I see it as play. So I don't really see myself as working, but I, I would, I, I, I don't think I would say you should force yourself to do anything. But I, I think for me, I do like to make a point of doing something creative every day whether it's writing or drawing or picking up a musical instrument and, you know, writing a little song or singing with your kids or your friends. I do like to do something creative. I don't ever force myself to, but, but I think it just keeps you staying creative. So, so you don't go through kind of a writer's block. You just mm. kind of, try to keep creative every day mm. so that's something keep I that, do. Mm, keep that creative part of the brain yeah. firing and the last of these three matthew is take yourself back to a moment in your life it can be any moment that you decide where it might be particularly <clears throat> difficult or there's adversity and imagine there's two versions of yourself there's the one who sat in front of me here with this incredible filmography uh, success all over the place simpsons pixar etc and there's one that didn't do any of those things. What's the key trait that differentiates the two? Well, you know, I think the first one was, you know, I believed I, I could do these things. And so I, um, I kind of wrote that story for myself if I want to do this. So I'm going to, I'm going to pursue it. But I also want to say one thing, too, because I don't want to make it sound like I've made every good choice in my life. <laughs> there are moments in my life that I do wish that I would have been more brave. And I would have said, hey, I think I say I'm already being timid when I'm saying this. <laughs> I was going to say, I think, but I would like to direct that or I have an idea that I would like to to pitch as a movie to direct. I think a lot of times we have to tell ourselves we truly can write our own story. And I know a lot of times we, we, we doubt ourselves. We fear what would happen if we actually said what we want to do. Even for me, there's been times in my life where I wish I could go back to certain moments and say, Matthew, just say that you want to, you want to do it. You know, you want to direct that thing or you want to write that thing. Don't be timid or scared or feel you're unexperienced. Really be brave. And so if I could go back to different moments of myself in my life, that's what I would say is, is be brave. Hmm. You know, thank you, Matthew. I've been in my absolute element. It's been <laughs> an incredible pleasure, man. I've really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks Mark. And thanks for pulling this out of me uh, <laughs> because there's a lot of great stuff that it's 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 almost therapeutic for myself as well to talk about this stuff so thank you oh good no no thank you